I think we'll get started. It is our tradition, even if people are still wandering in, to try to keep on time. Um, my name is Heidi Potter. I'm Chief Executive here at the Japan Society and delighted to see the um, very interested response to Peter's uh, Peter Konitsky's talk this evening uh, and to see so many of you here. Peter Konitsky doesn't really need any introduction to a Japan Society audience. He's Emeritus Professor of Japanese at Cambridge and a Fellow of the British Academy. He graduated in Japanese and Korean from Oxford University, then taught at the University of Tasmania and Kyoto University before moving to Cambridge in 1985. Peter has specialized in the cultural history of Japan, including the history of the book in Japan, how they were read, how ideas were circulated, and published um, with University of Hawaii Press in 1998, the book in Japan, A Cultural History. He's the author of many other books and articles, including Captain Oswald Tuck and the Bedford Japanese School from 1942 to 45, and with the Japan Society, British Royal and Japanese Imperial Relations, 150 years of association, engagement, and celebration with Sir Hugh Cortazzi and Anthony Best in 2019, 2019, and Japanese Studies in Britain, a survey in history in 2016, also co-edited with Sir Hugh Cortazzi. Today's talk, focusing on Elizabeth Anderson and wartime Japanese language courses, leads us into Professor Kornitsky's latest book, Eavesdropping on the Emperor, Interrogators and Code Breakers in Britain's War with Japan, which is published this April. But I'll hand straight over to Peter, uh, Peter Kornitsky. Welcome to the Japan Society and thank you very much for speaking to us this evening. Thank you very much. Heidi, and thanks to you and to Alejandra for um, making this possible. Um, I should perhaps say, first of all, that I haven't been patronizing a moonlighting barber, um, as you might see from my carefully shorn uh, locks. Uh, my wife has been following a YouTube <laughs> video which instructs her to how to uh, cut hair, and I think she's done a very good job. Uh, this actually is my first online lecture, so um, um, I'm hoping it's going to go uh, all right. Uh, let's see if we can get the first slide up for right away. Go, there we are. Um, this is the image of um, Bletchley Park, which has been very widely uh, shared and uh, been taken to be the epitome of Bletchley Park as it was uh, at the beginning of the war with groups of pipe smoking men with baggy Oxford trousers um, lounging around uh, on the lawn. Uh, but if you look closer, you can see in the doorway there are. Uh, three women who are waiting there. And the image of Bletchley Park is still very much that of brilliant men who broke the Enigma machine. But there were actually plenty of brilliant women too. And one of them was Elizabeth Anderson. Who was she? She was born in 1906 and took a degree in classics at Bedford College London in 1930. And after that, um, started working as a school teacher in a North London school. But she didn't take to teaching. Um, and within five years, she had uh, left the profession and instead moved to the Foreign Office. At the Foreign Office, she was immediately set to work on Italian codes. It's not clear whether she already knew Italian or whether she was just assumed to be able to pick up Italian because she had a good knowledge of Latin. At any rate, she was set to work on Italian codes. And in 1939, when the code breakers moved from central London out to Bletchley Park, she was in the first group who moved out there. So she was one of the founders of the Bletchley Park operation. And she worked there on Italian codes um, right up until 1943. What happened in 1943? In 1943, the armistice ended Italy's participation in the Second World War. And Bletchley Park now found itself with a large number of redundant Italian linguists. They were not allowed to leave Bletchley Park because they knew too much about what had been going on there. So most of them were then set to work to work on Japanese codes instead. And for that purpose, they needed to have a knowledge of Japanese. Elizabeth Anderson was one of those Bletchley Park Italianists who was sent on a Japanese course at the Bedford Japanese School. I'll be talking more about that later. 
But here you can see one of the very rare photographs of the students of Japanese at the Bedford Japanese School. Uh, Elizabeth Anderson is circled. And on the far right, um, you can see the young naval uh, student uh, who actually was Charles Borden. Some of you may know his name because in later life, he became professor of Mongolian at, at SOAS um, and a very distinguished uh, academic. So Elizabeth Anderson in 1943 started work uh, on a course mostly intended for Navy men, but she was one of three women on that course. And we'll look later at the school and the teachers uh, who taught her there. In 1944, she was sent to Mauritius. And she was sent there along with two other people who had studied Japanese at the Bedford Japanese School. One was called Robert Sellar, who's on the far left in this photo. And the other one was Sir Francis Dashwood, the son of the premier baronet of Great Britain. What's surprising about this is that there were three of the very precious graduates of the Bedford School, three of the very few people who had been trained during the Second War in Japanese, sent out to Mauritius. What on earth can there have been that was so important for them to do in Mauritius? What they were in fact doing was participating in a secret intercept station that, took, that was founded on Mauritius in 1939. Sellar was working on the Japanese codes and decrypting them, and in some cases, breaking uh, new codes that he ran, he came across. While Elizabeth Anderson, on the other hand, on the other hand who's on the right of this photograph here, uh, was uh, teaching Japanese to as many people as she could find in Mauritius uh, who had some kind of linguistic talent. So the, the two of them, plus Sir Francis Dashwood, were trying to expand the number of Japanese uh, speakers and Japanese linguists who could deal with the Japanese traffic that was being intercepted on Mauritius. I might add that um, the whole role of Mauritius as an intercept station for um, messages which were decrypted and translated uh, was entirely hidden until 10 years ago, and has only very recently uh, come to light. As you can see from this photograph, um, it wasn't all hard work on Mauritius. In their spare time, uh, they often went to the beach, and Robert Seller in particular, who was a keen mountaineer, um, he uh, climbed all the peaks he could find, both on Mauritius and on the neighboring island of Réunion. So these two, along with Sir Francis, stayed on Mauritius uh, right up until the end of the war. And we'll see later just exactly what um, they were doing there and how it had come to pass. So the question I want to address now is, how did it come about that Elizabeth Anderson and Robert Sellar and the others actually come to learn Japanese? It was a language that she had never encountered before um, and that she must have had no possible thought of learning until the outbreak of the war. And to explore the background behind this, we need to move back to 1938, because it was in that year that Sir Robert Craigie at the British Embassy in Tokyo started warning the War Office about the need to train people uh, in Japanese should they be needed in time of war. Sir Robert Craigie at the embassy was, um, by virtue of being the ambassador, in charge of the language program that the British Embassy ran, both for young uh, diplomats, but also for serving um, officers in the armed forces. And at the embassy, they tended to consider, as the military services did too, that three years were needed to get to a good level of Japanese. And so Sir Robert Craigie wrote back to the War Office saying, it's gonna take three years to train people. You know, if we wait until war breaks out, then we're gonna find it very difficult to, uh, to get the people we need um, with sufficient knowledge of the language. Unfortunately, the War Office uh, replied to him that in their view, they were adequately provided with Japanese linguists already um, and there was no need to worry. At about the same time, the leaders of SOAS, the director and some of the trustees were also writing to the war office and to figures they knew in government 
making the same point that it took a long time to train um, young men and women to learn Japanese to a high enough level, and that work really ought to be started well before any war were to break out. They too were fobbed off by the War Office and by other departments in the government. The one step that the War Office did take uh, happened in 1940, when the War Office advertised in the Times for linguists uh, who could join the intelligence corps as officers, provided they had a really good knowledge um, of the languages needed for the war. The War Office was clearly thinking primarily of German and Italian, um, but some of those who responded um, already had a good knowledge of Japanese, and they were brought on board too. One of them was the figure you can see on the left of the photograph here, um, the Reverend Eric Andrews. He had been uh, brought up in Japan because his father was uh, a missionary and then a bishop in Japan in the uh, late Meiji period. Andrews was then sent back to England for his university education, but he returned to Japan and was a missionary himself there um, and stayed there right up until 1941, when he was already uh, 55. So he had uh, a first class knowledge of Japanese and he felt it his duty, even though he was already 55, uh, to respond to that notice in the Times. And in May of 1941, he was sent out to Singapore and there he taught Japanese. Unfortunately, there are very few details now available of the, the structure in which he was teaching Japanese. Was it arranged by the War Office in London? Or perhaps more likely, was it run by the army authorities in Singapore? I don't know. But what I do know is that Richard Storey, who later became professor of Japanese history at Oxford and who in fact taught me when I was an undergraduate, he was one of those who attended the school in those months before the fall of Singapore. In the case of Eric Andrews, when the uh, end of Singapore was very clearly in sight, um, he chose not to escape um, as so many others were ordered to, and he stayed behind in Singapore. He was taken prisoner himself, and he became the chaplain to the prisoners of war at Changi Jail. Uh, and he only returned to Britain after the war as a much uh, older man. Richard's story, however, escaped and he will recur in this story. <clears throat> On the 7th and 8th of December 1941, as uh, you all know, um, the Pacific War began. It began not with the attack on Pearl Harbor, as so many people think, but it actually began with the invasion of Malaya, which was mounted from uh, Thailand and, and Burma. Sorry, from Thailand. And um, it was followed several hours later by the attacks on Pearl Harbor on the Philippines and Hong Kong. So at this point, um, Britain found itself at war with Japan, and so did the British dominions of Canada and Australia and the whole of the British Empire, in fact. At this point, uh, the War Office became worried. They may have felt they were adequately, adequately provided in 1938 and 1939, but they were no longer so sure. What's more, Bletchley Park was also beginning to get worried that they did not have enough talent in the way of Japanese linguists. Bletchley Park, in 1939 became the home of the Government Code and Cipher School, which was the government agency that is now called GCHQ, the Government Communications Headquarters. And at Bletchley Park, there was an extraordinary man, one of the greatest cryptographers of all time, uh, called Colonel John Tiltman. Now Tiltman uh, was not a linguist, but in 1933, um, he had begun working on Japanese diplomatic codes. And as he wrote in his uh, secret autobiography, let me just uh, add that this autobiography is unpublished. Um, it's not available in the United Kingdom. Um, it's not available in the National Archives, but there is a microfilm copy um, in the National Archives of the United States. And they're quite happy for um, people in Britain 
uh, to order microfilms. So that's how I read it. Um, you can't read it in, in the National Archives. So he wrote in this autobiography, and I quote, I myself have never been able to memorize more than a very small number of the very simplest Chinese characters. I suffer from a sort of mental block, which wipes out the memory of a character as soon as I take my eyes off it. So he did not consider himself a linguist. He, uh, he was a code breaker, um, but he realized that he needed linguists in order to translate the messages he had decrypted um, into English. And for that reason, he began to recruit linguists that he could find um, and hired them for the government code and cipher school. Some of their names um, are there, and let me provide a bit of background uh, briefly. Ernest Hobart Hamden had spent his entire career in the Japan consular service. In those days, the, the consular service was separate Can you hear me all right? Yes, sorry, Peter. Uh, I don't know what happened there. Um, he, he spent his entire career um, in, the, in the consular service in Japan and Japanese colonies. Um, and he spent the first couple of years learning Japanese and then um, became a, a, an expert Japanese speaker and was able to use Japanese both in, in the written um, and spoken forms. So he was one of a group of uh, Japanese linguists who already existed, um, people who had spent their lives in Japan in the consular service. The other three names there, um, Patrick Mar Johnson, Harry Shaw, and Eric Nave, were all people who had been language officers in Japan. This was a scheme which um, Professor Anthony Best uh, has written about in several of his books, which came to being at the time of the uh, Anglo-Japanese Alliance in 1902 and provided opportunities for Japanese to come to Britain and for uh, Britons to go to Japan and spend three years learning the language and spending summer time, time attached to the allies uh, uh, military divisions or units. Patrick Mar Johnson was in the army um, and during the war ran the Indian equivalent of Bletchley Park in Delhi. Harry Shaw was a Navy man and who got, who, he got the highest marks uh, ever in the British Embassy Japanese language exams until uh, Eric Nave turned up. Eric Nave was an Australian, um, one of the most brilliant linguists and code breakers, and uh, he got the highest marks ever after Harry Shaw. So these people were all available. They had superb command of Japanese, um, and they were all brought by Tiltman uh, into the Bletchley Park operation um, even before uh, the war began. So there were some linguists um, around, um, such as people like these, uh, people who have been diplomats, people who have been in the military, um, and there were of course some missionaries uh, who had spent many years in Japan. So the War Office's view that it was adequately provided was not completely without justification. Come December 1941, um, Tiltman turned his mind immediately to the need for far more linguists. Um, he realized that um, the Bletchley Park Japanese code operation was going to take a lot of talent, linguistic talent. Um, and he conceived the idea um, before the end of December, 1941 uh, for a language school. And he decided that the best possible uh, students for this language school would be uh, classicists. And that, the reasoning behind that was that classicists were the only people who had not yet been uh, called up for war service because nobody could really think of uh, a suitable uh, job for them to do. So he thought, first of all, they're available. Secondly, they have linguistic talent. And thirdly, he thought, if we go to the uh, best classicists available at Oxford and Cambridge, we're bound to get some who will be able to master Japanese. He put the scheme to the government um, and won approval for it. The problem, of course, was who was going to be the teacher. And the teacher he chose was Captain Oswald Tuck. Oswald Tuck was 65. He was retired. He last set foot in Japan in 1909. Who on earth was he? What possible contribution could he make? We will now see. Oswald Tuck actually had spent um, 
quite a bit of time in Japan um, in the early years of the 20th century um, and had become very much committed to learning the language. So much so that he was given permission by the Navy uh, to spend time uh, studying the language in Japan and eventually he became an assistant to the uh, naval attache in the Tokyo Embassy. These photographs, um, I might add, come from the collection of his grandson who lives in Bromley and who also owns uh, Tuck's diaries, uh, which are a mine of information about Tuck's life. Tuck, uh, as you can see from the slide here, served on the China station for nine years, had already acquired a good knowledge of Japanese by 1903, but in 1909, he returned to the UK. And for the rest of his career, he was working as a translator for the Admiralty, um, translating Japanese documents, um, some of them provided by the Japanese Navy um, for the, the Admiralty. And that was true until 1939, when he was appointed one of two Japanese censors to work with Arthur Whaley, the famous translator, in the uh, Press and Communication Censorship Office um, in London. Their job was to look at all the dispatches that uh, Japanese uh, correspondents for newspapers and Japanese individuals were sending back to Japan to check that no secrets were being, uh, were, were being uh, conveyed in those communications. In 1941, however, um, he was summoned by, uh, by Tiltman um, at Bletchley Park and uh, was uh, told that he was going to be running this course and he returned to work. Tuck wrote in his diary that Tiltman's proposal was this, you have to train young undergraduates to be able to read with a dictionary ordinary cables in Japanese, and you have to do it in six months. And Tuck added, this sounds impossible, but is worth trying. And so for the next month, he spent uh, all his days trying to devise a course, a course that would teach the students uh, not how to conduct polite conversation in Japanese, but how to read and interpret military and diplomatic telegrams. So it was a very clipped form of the Japanese language, and it was a form of the language which included the kind of vocabulary that we do not teach our undergraduates anymore. It was the kind of vocabulary that perhaps some of those uh, who had been military language officers in Japan already had a grasp of, but it was not the kind of vocabulary that, for example, uh, missionaries had any knowledge of. There was, of course, no textbook for this kind of, of Japanese. So uh, Tuck had to devise it all himself. And at, at first, he had to uh, teach by dictation, by dictating all his notes. On the slide here, you can see, incidentally, on the right, a letter that was written to him immediately after war broke out by one of his good friends um, at a Japanese bank um, in London. <clears throat> And so the Bedford Japanese School began. And um, Tuck turned out to have been an inspired choice. He was a very gifted teacher. I had a message uh, two years ago from Professor Donald Russell, the professor of classical literature at Oxford, who described Tuck as the best teacher he had ever met in his entire career. Tuck certainly seems to have um, inspired not only him, but many others who went through this Japanese course as a person who very effectively could convey um, the elements of the language, but encourage students to work for themselves. You can see on the right hand side of the slide here, the notes from the dictated skeleton grammar that Tut devised, which were taken by Patrick Field, who is one of the few survivors of the wartime Bedford Japanese school, um, now living in Saffron Walden, who has made, kindly made available to me uh, all the notes and material that he took from the Bedford Japanese school. How effective was Tuck? At the end of the first six months from the first group, a few of the students were taken to be tested by a group consisting of former language officers and diplomats who already had a great knowledge of Japanese and who were frankly skeptical um, of Tuck Tiltman's scheme and of Tuck's teaching. They didn't believe it would be possible to 
can teach in six months uh, students enough Japanese to be of use. So they gave a handful of the students uh, a couple of dispatches produced by a Japanese press agency and sent them to translate it. Uh, within 15 minutes, the students had come back. They translated um, the first page uh, without mistake. And then since there hadn't been time to write down the translation of the second page, did it at sight and got no mistakes. The skeptics were convinced and Tiltman and Tuck were given permission to run a succession of subsequent courses. And in the end, there were 11 courses uh, in all. You can see here um, another, one of the few surviving class photographs. Um, the two who are circled are the only two I know of who are still alive. The bottom left is Ian Willison, who worked for many years at the British Library. And on the right is John Cook, who was um, a teacher and then an educationalist um, in Edinburgh. According to people who I have spoken to who were at the classes, uh, Captain Tuck only wore his naval uniform, which you can see him wearing here, uh, when visitors came and when the photograph, photographer came to take a class photograph. <clears throat> As I've said, most of the students at the Bedford School were classicists from Oxford or Cambridge, but there was, were some exceptions. And one of the most interesting of those um, is this woman who was a, 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 an officer in the Women's Royal, Na Royal Naval Service, Mary Tate. Uh, she was in fact the only woman on the first course. Uh, she had a BA in modern languages, uh, which she took from London University. And she spent some years living in Cairo after that, and then married an army officer before she joined the Women's Royal Naval Service and was sent to Bletchley Park. Why was she recruited for the Japanese schools? I don't know. Um, it is possible that her linguistic abilities had been recognized in Cairo. Um, perhaps she had already mastered Arabic. Um, this is one of those cases where it's so far been impossible to pin her down more exactly. I've been in touch with one of her uh, uh, nieces and nephews, and they are trying to find out uh, from the um, naval archives which can only be looked at by dependents and uh, descendants, um, exactly what her record was. And I can't yet say anything more about that than this. So while all that was going on in Bedford and uh, Bletchley Park, at the same time, uh, SAWAS was reviving its pressure on the War Office. And after December 1941, of course, the War Office was more inclined to listen and decided that it was not after all so adequately provided. And very speedy negotiations uh, were conducted with SOAS and with Dulwich College uh, to the south of London. It was decided to run um, a course for 18 months. The Bedford course was only for six months, but the SOAS course was going to be for 18 months, and all the students would be accommodated at Dulwich. Now, at this stage, um, it was only imagined that uh, boys just out of school would be uh, recruited for the courses. And so they've become known as the Dulwich Boys. And advertisements were put in the press. And there were 660 um, applicants from the whole of the UK who applied for these courses in Chinese, Japanese, Persian, and Turkish. But actually very few of the applicants chose Japanese. For example, Patrick O'Neill, who later became professor of Japanese at SOAS, uh, opted for Turkish, um, but instead he was assigned to learn Japanese and uh, that determined uh, the rest of his career. Um, so the first course started on the 1st of May 1942, but the subsequent courses um, included uh, a number of women students and some courses were run only for women at SOAS um, during the war. One of the problems, of course, was teachers. In 1940, there were only two teachers of Japanese at SOAS, and both of them were about to retire. But in that year, Frank Daniels and his Japanese wife, Otome, arrived, and that brought some new blood to the teaching of Japanese at SOAS. And Daniels' first task was to recruit as many teachers as he could find. And many of them he found 
oddly enough, on the Isle of Man. This was because the Isle of Man was used as an internment center for uh, Japanese who had been part of the rather large Japanese community in London, and they were all interned on the Isle of Man. Some, as I have already mentioned, were returned to uh, Japan uh, when a repatriation exchange ship left uh, Britain in 1942, um, but many chose not to go back to Japan. And one of those was uh, this man, Matsukawa Baiken, who came to London in 1915 and uh, stayed. Uh, he married a British woman and uh, he worked for many years as the London correspondent of the Dorme Press uh, in Japan. He chose uh, not to be repatriated, but was quite willing to teach Japanese. Um, and uh, he did so, as you can see here. This um, photograph was taken in 1943 um, by a Czech photographer, um, and it shows him teaching some military students um, at SOAS. The photographs uh, were not published until after the war, and that applies to some of the other photographs that I, I will be showing you. Um, in addition, um, some more uh, teachers uh, who had a native command of Japanese were needed. Um, Matsukawa Baiken and a few others from the Isle of Man were not sufficient. So four Canadian or can Japanese Canadians uh, were recruited and they came in 1943 and 1944 and taught a number of courses in SOAS. Uh, they were not wanted in Canada because Japanese Canadians were distrusted, even though some of them had served with distinction in the First World War. So after lengthy negotiations, the British government won permission for um, some of them to come to London to work at SOAS. At first, um, the War Office insisted on separate courses for the translators on the one hand and the interpreters on the other hand. This didn't work. It was found that those who were interpreters needed to have some knowledge of characters and on the other hand, that some of those who were going to be translators needed to have some grasp of spoken Japanese as well. So a unified course was eventually taught. But some of the courses were aimed at particular branches of the services. For example, there were some courses for Navy students only so that only naval vocabulary would be taught to them. And there were even courses which were run by the linguistics department at SOAS by specialists in African or Indian languages. They didn't know a word of Japanese, but they were experts in linguistics and experts in training uh, students to be able to pick up sounds um, and understand what they heard. And one of them, uh, later to become the first professor of general, general linguistics in the UK, John Firth, started devising Japanese language courses to train eavesdroppers. And we can see three of them being trained here. They were um, listening here to tapes which have been um, put together by the Japanese Canadians and by Matsukawa Baiken and their colleagues. And they were giving the kind of um, uh, messages, kind of uh, statements that you might hear when he's dropping on, for example, uh, Japanese Air Force messages, um, such as uh, bombing target in sight, um, enemy fighters approaching and so forth. So all these kind of sentences were pre-recorded and uh, these uh, men you can see in the picture were learning how to, to recognize what they heard. And later they were sent out to serve in India or Burma, listening in to Japanese pilots or to Japanese um, naval officers um, and trying to, uh, uh, to detect the, the language they were listening to and then interpret and pass on the intelligence as soon as possible. So now we have uh, both Bedford and SOAS providing uh, courses in Japanese, but the, the demand was insatiable. Uh, but actually Park um, required more and more, um, and they weren't getting enough from Bedford, um, even though they began to start recruiting from the SOAS courses. So in the end, they began uh, running their own courses in the naval section. Mostly they were aimed at people who had been working with Italian codes and Italian decrypts, uh, like Elizabeth Anderson. And this teacher they used was John Owen Lloyd, who was one of the people who had worked in the Japanese consular service and had picked up a good knowledge of J Japanese while serving in Japan 
uh, before the war, as you can see from the brief account of his life uh, on the slide. Uh, and so we have now a third uh, element within um, Britain where uh, training has been done to produce more and more Japanese linguists. There was also a demand um, outside the United Kingdom, um, and that demand was at its highest in Delhi, and that was at the Wireless Experimental Center. This rather oddly named institution was in fact the Indian equivalent of Bletchley Park. It was an intercept station that was also working on decoding um, Japanese army and other codes, uh, translating the messages decrypted and passing on the intelligence. Uh, you can see uh, in this slide here, um, the School of Japanese Instruction that was set up to provide more students for uh, the Wireless Experimental Center. And in the back two rows uh, are the students and the front row are the teachers. The figure um, who is circled there, you might recognize and he might even be uh, listening this evening. Um, that is Professor Ian Nish um, to give him his current title, but at that stage, he was um, a very junior uh, member of the British Army. Who then were the teachers? Um, if you look at the front row um, there, you can see um, the second from the left is a man whose name in the official list of those shown in this photograph is given as Kao, K-A-O. Um, and the person who um, is further to the right, the young woman, and just to the left of her, the older man, they have the surname Go, G-O-H. Um, it seems that they had all adopted uh, Chinese uh, appearing names uh, so as not to be taken for Japanese, though they were in fact uh, Japanese. And the figure at the extreme right is a Mr. Kitaoka, who was also um, a Japanese who had been living and working in India, but was willing to teach his own language at the School of Instruction there in uh, Karachi. <clears throat> One of the students at the school in Karachi um, was Richard Mason. In 1957, he became famous for the uh, book and then particularly the film, The World of Susie Wong. Richard Mason, though, was a serious linguist. He was at the Battle of Impal in uh, Northeast India um, in 1943 with Richard Storey um, and other linguists. Um, and in his spare time, when not working as an interpreter, translator, and intelligence officer, he wrote a book called The Wind Cannot Read, which was eventually published in 1946. In this novel, um, a young RAF officer, flying officer Michael Quinn, um, is learning Japanese and falls in love with his teacher. Uh, his teacher was uh, a Japanese woman who adopted a Chinese name so as not to be taken for a Japanese in India. Now, in the film version, uh, Michael Quinn was played by Dirk Bogard. And in the clip you can see on the right, um, Dirk Bogard is doing his best to imitate his teacher and to pronounce Japanese. And if you watch the film, you can see that Dirk Bogard is making a pretty brave attempt at pronouncing a language he had obviously um, never learnt. Um, and if you look more closely um, at the film, you can even see that all the students have on their desks copies of the red wartime edition of Kenkyusha Japanese English Dictionary. That's the wartime edition produced in the United States. Another place where there was a demand for linguists uh, was Mauritius, which I already mentioned before as a place to which Elizabeth Anderson was sent. Peter Twining um, arrived in Mauritius in 1939 um, as a young colonial officer. He was put in charge of censorship and on his own initiative, without any instructions from Whitehall, he began monitoring the Vichy French signals that were coming from Madagascar and found that they had a number of uh, items of intelligence value. And he began uh, to work on the codes. And with the help of um, his colleagues, he began to translate uh, and pass on the messages uh, to London. This work turned out to be very valuable. And he was encouraged to do more and to recruit uh, more 
uh, interceptors and translators. But the operation that she ran became much more um, deeply appreciated from December 1941 onwards. Mauritius is quite a high island. And what's more, there is very little in the way of um, land between Mauritius and Japan. So Mauritius had the ability to pick up a huge number of signals from Japan and from Japanese colonies that could not be picked up um, even from places rather nearer, such as India. So he had exceptionally good rece reception and uh, he was able to pick up messages and he worked on uh, decoding them with the help of the three who were sent out from uh, the Bedford School, uh, Pete Robert Sellar and Elizabeth Anderson uh, and so on. Um, and they began to translate the messages they decrypted and pass the information back to London and some of it went on to Washington. Quite a lot of this uh, information we can learn uh, from the brief memoir written by uh, his, uh, his uh, wife's sister, which uh, survives in an archive in Surrey. Peter Twining himself uh, wrote uh, an autobiography, which has not been published, but his son possesses um, in Oxford. But the whole episode of his wartime censorship, uh, he felt clearly to be too sensitive even to include in a private memoir. So that whole chapter is, is missing from his memoir. Um, there are some uh, sources available in the National Archives and elsewhere, which I've used in the book. Um, but what is clear is that the Mauritius interception station was providing intelligence that was highly valued by the Navy, by Washington, even President Roosevelt read some of it. Um, so this was another area where there was a demand for Japanese linguists and where the products of the Bedford Japanese school were um, highly valued and uh, able to put their knowledge to good use. <laughs> so far, I've been mentioning uh, linguists being trained in England or in India, but a few British linguists were trained in the USA. <clears throat> and in late 1943, the four young naval officers uh, you can see in this photograph uh, were ordered to Boulder, Colorado, which is the home of the University of Colorado. But during the war, it was also the home of the US Navy Language School. And these four were to join uh, the American students there. Their American colleagues were all just out of university. They had been hastily brought into the Navy. Um, and by contrast, the four British students already had some years of experience in the Navy. One of their American colleagues wrote home to his parents as follows. The main topic of conversation at the language school right now is the arrival of five officers of the British Navy who are here like the rest of us to plunge into the study of Japanese. They all look as if they've been dug out of the recesses of the British Museum, small, thin, pale, and respectable. Okay, it's true that thanks to the wartime diet, um, they were probably not as well fed as their uh, American colleagues. But as I've said, the American students were all straight out of university while the four shown here and the other one who was with them um, had all seen action. Second from the left in the photograph is William Beasley, later to, be, to become professor of Far Eastern history at SOAS. He had been on the destroyer Tata at the sinking of the Bismarck. Um, so he'd been in the thick of the action and actually saw the sinking of the Bismarck. Another of his colleagues there had watched from a destroyer in December, 1941, when the battleship Prince of Wales was sunk off Singapore. And for all that he may have been small, thin, pale and bespectacled, uh, Beasley was top of his class at the language school in Boulder. Let us now uh, slowly come to uh, a uh, conclusion, some concluding remarks. So as I've been demonstrating, uh, SOAS and the British Embassy had been haranguing the War Office from 1938 onwards to face up to the deficiency in linguists in Britain. Why was uh, the United Kingdom so much behind in the business of training linguists? To some extent, um, you can attribute it to complacency in the War Office that they had enough linguists. They certainly had some. There were some people who had worked in the uh, 
Japan consular service, and there were also uh, a number of language officers. But that turned out to be far uh, fewer than were needed for the war effort. And perhaps a further consideration, as Anthony Best has shown, uh, is that the war office consistently underestimated the Japanese armed forces uh, until the sinking of the Prince of Wales and the Repulse on the 10th of December, 1941. At any rate, whatever the reasons, uh, Britain was slow at taking up the challenge of training linguists. Australia and the USA started uh, well before. In the case of Australia, um, it was as early as August 1940 that the censorship office in Melbourne launched its own Japanese language school. This was not only to train censors, though censors were needed who could read Japanese mail, but it was also to train um, military men uh, and intercept interceptors who would listen into Japanese broadcasts and um, translate and interpret uh, during the war. So, that was really being anticipated um, in August 1940 in Australia. There was one native Japanese speaker uh, in Australia who, whose name was Inagaki Moshi and who was teaching in Melbourne. You might imagine that he would have been invited to teach on this course, um, but he wasn't. Um, he was in fact interned and throughout the rest of the war, he remained in internment in Australia. And after the end of the war, he was forcibly repatriated to Japan. So as in Canada and in the United States, uh, so too in Australia, there was an inborn suspicion of Japanese, even though they, uh, some of them had been uh, living for many years um, in their adopted countries, there was a suspicion of them and a reluctance to use them uh, even as teachers. Um, eventually, uh, some were used as teachers, uh, not only those taken off in, in SAWAS, but also in the United States and eventually in Canada. So the Australian school was actually run by uh, somebody called Dorothy Selwood, uh, who had a Japanese mother and had grown up and lived in Japan right up until 1939 and had a, a very good knowledge of Japanese. And she started producing uh, graduates that were immediately uh, taken on by uh, the uh, island hopping campaigns uh, that began in 1942. The United States, on the other hand, um, had started uh, running Japanese courses um, a couple of months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Marine Corps um, launched a Japanese course in Hawaii that, of course, was hastily moved uh, to mainland uh, America soon after the attack on Pearl Harbor. On the other hand, the US Navy uh, began courses uh, which were taught by the children of missionaries um, and um, various Japanese Americans. This course was originally started in California, but uh, in California, all Japanese Americans were interned on the outbreak of the Pacific War. And so the school moved away from the West Coast to Colorado, where there were no such restrictions and Japanese Americans uh, could be recruited uh, as teachers. Though it should be emphasized that the Japanese Americans were only uh, acceptable as teachers at the Boulder School. They weren't acceptable as students. So they weren't to be used um, on the front lines as interpreters, as eavesdroppers, and so on. The only um, Japanese Americans uh, who were um, given uh, trainings in Japanese to enable them to deal with military Japanese were uh, some who were taken to the army, um, but only as non commissioned officers. Very, very few of them were given. Uh, positions as officers, and they had to serve under white American officers um, throughout the war. In the case of Canada, Canada was even slower than uh, Britain. Uh, the Japanese language school in Vancouver was only opened in August 1943. Uh, Japanese Canadians were not admitted as students or teachers uh, until 1945, owing to the uh, consistent um, uh, racial prejudice in uh, British Columbia uh, against Japanese Canadians and distrust of their loyalty, even if they had been born in Canada and had Canadian citizenship. What about the various courses that were run? How effective were they? At Bletchley Park and at its equivalent in the United States, Arlington Hall in Washington, the courses were much shorter and they focused on the kind of clipped telegraphic Japanese uh, 
that was used for telegrams. On the other hand, at uh, Samas and at Boulder and, um, and other places, the courses were longer um, at 18 months. And they had taught people to be able to uh, translate um, documents, to uh, interrogate prisoners of war, um, and to eavesdrop by uh, listening to live uh, radio transmissions in the clear. And it's clear, and there are many examples given in my book, that those who went through these courses uh, performed miracles, either um, working on codes at Bletchley Park or um, on the field of action, like uh, Louis Allen, who used to teach at the University of Durham, who came across documents in the jungle in Burma that were able to alter the course of the war. Um, others um, dealt with the a need to debrief and interrogate uh, prisoners of war and find out what information they could convey. Uh, many were involved, particularly in the Burma campaign, uh, in eavesdropping. They were based on RAF stations or on Royal Navy ships, and their job was to listen in to the uh, messages that were sent in the clear, um, particularly by pilots, um, and uh, be able to pass on information about forthcoming raids, for example, or whether um, allied planes had been spotted um, and so forth. The achievements, um, I have given some examples in my book, but a great deal is still covered by the Official Secrets Act, surprising though it may seem. Earlier, uh, late last year rather, uh, John Ferris um, produced the official history of the uh, GCHQ, the Government Communications Headquarters, a very bulky book, uh, and at the beginning of that he claims that all the wartime records relating to uh, decryption and so on are now in the public domain. That is demonstrably not true. Um, I could give you lists of large numbers of documents um, that are still retained um, by the, um, um, uh, the, the National Archives at Kew um, or by GCHQ. So um, in some cases, it's still not possible to uh, provide uh, details about what they achieved on the field, but there are some cases, um, particularly where the information was passed on to the United States, where the information is now in the public domain, but not in Britain. What about the future careers of the uh, men and women I have uh, talked about today? Many of them had their lives changed, um, and changed in a way that perhaps is of interest to members of the Japan Society, um, they, because they became specialists in East Asia um, for the rest of their lives. One of them was, of course, uh, Jeffrey Bonus, who became the foundation professor of uh, Japanese at the University of Sheffield, who did one of the Bedford courses um, and was trained as a code breaker. And then there was Richard Story, whom I've already mentioned, who had lived in Japan before the outbreak of war, uh, went through some retraining in Singapore, um, and then for the rest of the war was working in India and Burma and undertook um, an epic 1,000 mile journey across Burma uh, with a team of translators and interpreters, which he commanded, um, picking up information as they went. A number of others um, also became specialists um, in Japan, such as uh, Eric Kiedel, uh, John McEwen, Carmen Blacker, and Patrick O'Neill, um, who all taught Japanese in British universities after the war um, and learned their Japanese during the war. But there were some um, who returned to their previous lives. Uh, one of them is Jim Sutherland, um, who sadly died a year ago. Um, I, it took me a long time to find him. He was one of the graduates of the Bedford School of Japanese. Uh, he spent many years living in Edinburgh, where he was uh, an accountant, and he then retired to Peebles, where I, I spent several days interviewing him um, just over uh, a year ago. Although he had uh, gone back to uh, a civilian career and had nothing directly to do with Japan uh, after the end of the war, he retained an affection for Japan, and his house uh, contained many mementos um, of his visits to Japan. And while he was living in Edinburgh, he and his wife uh, took the trouble to uh, invite visiting Japanese students um, to their home. So he retained an affection for Japan that came out of his wartime experience, um, first uh, as a student of Japanese at Bedford, then as a 
um, a, a decoder in India, and finally as a member of the uh, occupation in, um, in 1945 and 1946. Another person who um, went back to his former interests was Hugh Lloyd-Jones, who ended his life as Professor Sir Hugh Lloyd-Jones and Regis Professor of Greek at Oxford. Um, he uh, had done one of the uh, first Bedford courses um, and was one of the few who were sent directly out to India uh, to provide linguistic expertise at the Wireless Experimental Center um, in Delhi. Um, he was then sent out into um, the jungle in, in the uh, Burma campaign and achieved a number of uh, intelligent successes. But he put all that behind him in 1945, um, never went to Japan and turned his attention back to classics. What about Elizabeth Anderson? On her way out to Mauritius, she had uh, encountered a British army captain, Captain Ramsey um, of Nairobi. And soon after the end of the war, uh, she and Captain Ramsey uh, married and uh, settled in Nairobi. She died in 1993. These people um, and the many others who I've not been able to mention here, some of them are featured in the book, uh, were some of the unsung and forgotten heroes of the Second World War. They put their very rapidly acquired knowledge of Japanese uh, to use, providing uh, what was often crucial intelligence and their contribution deserves, I think, to be remembered. In fact, I've dedicated the book to their memory. Many of them uh, died before it was possible for them to tell even their nearest and dearest what they had done during the war. Um, others um, retained the habit of secrecy for the rest of their lives. And even when it became possible for them to talk about their experiences, didn't do so. So many of their descendants, um, have been uh, fascinated to find out what um, can be known from the National Archives about their wartime contributions. These people also show us that it really was possible to learn Japanese in a hurry, even in just six months, to learn enough Japanese uh, to be able to use their knowledge and to use it at moments during the war when people's lives depended on the accuracy of their translations. I can never claim that anybody's life has depended on the accuracy of my translations. But thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Yes, the, the, there were, um, uh, Glenn Fukushima um, refers to the various other courses that were run in the United States. Um, um, I didn't mention those in my lecture, though they are briefly mentioned in my book. The point is that the only one, the only British students were those who were, which were at Boulder at the US Navy Language School. Um, I showed a photograph of four. There were five in the first group, um, but they're altogether 20. Um, what's very unclear is why they were there. Mm -hmm. um, I've not been able to find uh, anything in their memoirs uh, or in the archives, um, except that according to uh, William Beasley's uh, private memoir, which his son has, um, he answered a call from the Admiralty uh, for volunteers to go to the United States to learn Japanese. He volunteered and he went. But why the Admiralty was sending people to, uh, to uh, the United States is unclear. My guess is that the object was um, partly to train um, young naval officers in Japanese, but also to establish a liaison with the US Navy. And in fact, William Beasley and the other students who, the other British students who learned Japanese at Boulder, all fulfilled uh, liaison roles uh, at the end of the war and in the immediate post-war during the occupation. So that I think is, um, is the case. Uh, Glenn Fukushima also asks were the two off efforts completely separate. One thing I can say is that at the end of the first course at the Bedford Japanese School, um, Colonel Tiltman, whose idea the school was, uh, passed on to his counterparts at Arlington Hall in Washington, uh, the success of the course. And they were frankly incredulous um, and asked for uh, proof. And so Tiltman had some of the students write a skeleton grammar of uh, military uh, and diplomatic telegraph Japanese, which was sent on to Arlington Hall and Arlington Hall clearly followed the pattern that Tiltman had uh, initiated 
because they too inaugurated a class, a class which would be highly concentrated on military and diplomatic vocabulary, would ignore all ordinary Japanese, ordinary Japanese grammar, and just deal with the clip Japanese grammar that you find in telegrams. We know quite a bit about the, the kind of Japanese language that was taught um, because we have, for example, the, the notebooks which Patrick Field and, and others kept. Um, so we can see with the dictation they took down um, and we can see the kind of examples they work with. They, the examples they work with were mostly taken from real cables. Um, mm -hmm. Bletchley Park was a bit uh, reluctant to release um, any uh, secret cables they had decrypted because they didn't want knowledge of the decryption process to get out of Bletchley Park. But Captain Tuck was no pushover. He kept pressing Bletchley Park, arguing that if you want to train people uh, to read the kind of Japanese that you at Bletchley Park are dealing with, then you've got to release some of the telegrams. So eventually mm -hmm. Bletchley Park did. So the kind of texts they were working on um, were the kind of telegrams that uh, were being sent by, for example, Japanese headquarters um, to army units or naval units elsewhere. So they're working with, with real material. Um, uh, those who were training at, at uh, the Bedford Japanese School or Bletchley Park itself or at Arlington Hall in the United States were only dealing with this kind of material. The courses at, at SOAS and in various parts of the United States, which were longer, um, mm -hmm tried to cover a, a wider range of Japanese to include some spoken Japanese. Um, again, principally the vocabulary was that of um, military and diplomatic situations. Um, though in some cases, for example, in the United States courses, the, the plans have, have survived and they show some of the lessons dealt with, for example, going to the theater in Japan. It's, this kind of situation was completely removed from the courses that were run in SOAS. Mm -hmm. and, and Bedford because they were completely irrelevant. Um, they were not trying to inculcate any social Japanese, but the essential Japanese that was needed for the precise uh, matter at hand and no more. Yeah, it depends which course you're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. At Bedford, um, they, they learned about 500, mm -hmm. um, but um, you have to remember that, that most of the messages that were being sent by Japanese um, diplomatic bodies or military bodies uh, were sent either in Romaji or in Kana. They were not being sent uh, using any, any kanji. So um, for the most part, um, they were sent in, in Romaji. The diplomatic corps used only uh, Romaji. So the messages that were coming out of Berlin, for example, from the Japanese embassy in Berlin, were all being sent, uh, of course, heavily encrypted, um, but fundamentally in Romaji. Um, and the military tended to use the Japanese Morse code rather than the international Morse code. And they used that to send messages in katakana. So kanji were not really a great deal of use in these circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, those who needed to have a good knowledge of kanji were those who were sent out to the field and whose job it was to pick up documents on the battlefield, often off corpses. As many have noted, the documents were often stained, sometimes blood stained. Uh, they were often damp. Um, they were often in a poor state of preservation, but they needed to be um, translated as quickly as possible. And since those were mostly handwritten, in some cases printed, they needed to have a knowledge of kanji. And so for these, the SOAS students uh, learnt larger numbers of, of kanji, over a thousand. Um, but when they were going into situations like that, they all carried in their backpacks uh, supplies of dictionaries. Um, mm. Most who were sent out to the field had a Kenkyusha and a Kanji dictionary with them. And in one case in New Guinea, um, this actually saved um, an interpreter's life. Um, he was in a, a patrol and he was acting as the interpreter and translator. And he had the bulky dictionaries in his backpack. The patrol was ambushed. Um, he was the only one to survive. Um, because the bullets studded into his dictionaries. He rolled in under the jeep and, and uh, went away, um, whereas all the others who had been in his jeep uh, were killed or wounded and then subsequently died. Um, so in his case, the dictionaries literally saved his life. What, well, the, the important point is that although they didn't learn a large number of characters um, on their courses, they knew how to find characters and how to uh, then uh, do the translation needed. And the characters they learned were, again, 
not the characters for Sakura, for example, mm. or Flower or Bento. They were the characters for Bomb, for Kill, for uh, um, Fighter Plane, and, and so forth. So it, it, to go back to the question that somebody asked earlier, not a lot of this is uh, terribly useful for the teaching of Japanese today, it has to be admitted. Um, but what it shows is that um, with motivated students, it was possible uh, to teach Japanese uh, in a great, a great hurry. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has to be asked, and I asked myself, whether this would be possible today with, for example, a different war situation with a different enemy speaking a, a language not taught in schools. Uh, very uh, much fewer um, uh, students are these days studying languages in school or, or university than was the case 30 or 40 years ago. There are far fewer classicists around. So the kind of almost miraculous transformation of classicists and modern linguists into Japanese linguists that took place during the war, um, I think would be difficult to replicate these days. Um, English was taught in Japanese schools. Um, mm -hmm. There were also a number of uh, Japanese uh, who um, were the children of uh, Japanese Americans or Japanese Canadians who were sent back to Japan for their education and then served in the Japanese armed forces during the war. So there, there wasn't really a shortage of um, linguists um, in the Japanese armed forces. Um, mm -hmm. What is more, um, it is probably true to say that there was uh, a lower emphasis placed on um, intelligence and battlefield intelligence um, on the Japanese side. So um, there was um, much less effort made to uh, use documents um, that were found on the battlefield or to eavesdrop. Um, and what is quite interesting is the fact that it, it seems that um, in the Japanese armed forces, there was never any uh, appreciation of the possibility of uh, large numbers of British, Australian, American, Canadians being trained in Japanese to read documents. And so, for example, battle orders uh, and uh, personal military diaries were often taken into battle by Japanese soldiers and Japanese officers. Um, and when their corpses were found on the battlefield, they were often found to con convey whole strategic uh, operations and plans uh, on their person, which was of course not something that uh, was normal for most armies to do. Um, and it's generally thought, it generally appears to be the case that um, the Japanese who were carrying these documents did not expect uh, that anybody would be in a position to read them uh, were they found. Um, and so that was one of the reasons why a great deal of effort was made during the war to keep uh, all the language programs uh, secret, as secret as possible. The only um, connection was that a few of them were used as teachers. Mm -hmm. It's true that the Royal Navy and the Army, and indeed the Royal Air Force from 1918 onwards, um, had language programs um, and they sent individuals to Japan. Um, but until um, the late 1930s, um, this was largely a matter of military diplomacy. Um, and it, it was a way of um, providing direct connections between the armed forces of the two allies, Britain and Japan. So many of those who uh, were sent out from Britain spent their three years in Japan, uh, later served careers which had absolutely no connection with Japan whatsoever. So they never actually put their Japanese into use. And it was only those who uh, went out in the 1930s, and that was a relatively small number, two or three uh, a year, um, who then had any, any role to play during the war. Some of them worked as teachers, for example, at the uh, Japanese language school at, at Karachi, which had its earlier um, formation in Simla in North India. Um, and uh, that's really the only connection that you can make. Um, the programs that were set up at SOAS and at, uh, at Bedford were uh, dealing with um, uh, rather different needs and uh, they didn't employ or use any of those people um, who had been uh, trained during the war. The few of them who were useful were sent to Bletchley Park, such as John Owen, whom I mentioned, and a couple of others who ended up in Bletchley Park and worked there, but on their own, there were far too few of them. And that was the reason for the great need to train people 
um, from uh, 1941 onwards. John McEwen is one case in point um, uh, who was on one of the SOAS courses. Um, and when he went out to Japan, he gradually began to uh, feel that um, Japan had been one of the victims of European, North American economic and political imperialism um, and began to feel uh, that he should really have no part in this whole operation. Uh, he wasn't the only one. Um, there were others like that who, uh, whose understanding of um, the geopolitics of the situation leading up to the Second World War and indeed the whole era of imperialism and, and colonialism uh, became very clear to them um, and they really wanted to have nothing more to do with it, particularly during the occupation of Japan. Um, some who were extremely critical of the way mm -hmm. um, British, uh, American and Canadian and Australian forces um, used Japanese women, for example. Um, it's not a very savory tale, but it's um, part of the occupation uh, that part of its history that tended to be covered up in, in later years. So um, there were people who, who had worked on decoding and then later began to look at um, their role in the war in a different light. Even that, is that true? That's true of uh, Sir Hugh Lloyd-Jones, the Regis Professor of Greek. Um, his son told me that um, he had been involved in one uh, episode um, in the jungle war in Burma, when uh, his quick thinking, his ability to decrypt a message quickly um, and translate it led to the entire elimination of a Japanese division. And his son asked him, uh, well, what did you feel about uh, all the, the widows this was leaving? And Hugh commented, um, I didn't think about it at the time, but I think about it more and more now. Somebody's asked if I'm based in Scotland. No, I'm actually uh, based in London. I do have an interest in Orkney, which this person also asks, because um, one of the uh, people who's trained at SAWAS um, was a classicist who uh, grew up in Orkney, went to university in Edinburgh and was sent out to uh, Australia where he worked as a decoder um, in MacArthur's operation. Um, that's another story which mm -hmm. uh, also features in the book but is was too big to include in, in this lecture. It depended. Some of those um, at uh, SOAS were trained to be uh, interpreters and interrogators. So they needed to be able to uh, ask questions and answer and understand the replies when interrogating prisoners of war. So those did speak, again, primarily military Japanese, but they did have a good understanding of Japanese. John McEwen was one of them, um, and there were others. And Hugh Kotatsi was, of course, another one. Is uh, there any recording? Someone was asking if there were recordings of the students speaking at the time. And not that I know of. Um, mm -hmm. The only... Um, representation is that film, The, w the Wind Cannot Read. Um, mm -hmm. Although it's not a great film, it has to be admitted, it was a, a great success in its time. It was one of the most popular films of its year. And the scene of um, uh, the various uh, students uh, trying to speak Japanese following their teacher um, is impressive. Um, they've done a good job at recreating the atmosphere of, of learning an unfamiliar language there in India. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Somebody else, Roger Macy has asked, wasn't handwriting a very specialized skill? That was taught by uh, Otome Daniels at SOAS because one of the uh, problems that was recognized immediately was that the documents were left on the battlefield uh, were often um, handwritten and sometimes reproduced handwritten documents. And so the students needed to be trained uh, in how to be able to read handwriting. Um, that was true of Louis Allen, for example. He went through the course which included an element in uh, recognizing and deciphering uh, handwritten documents. And so that was a, a, a skill that they were taught um, at, at SOAS, not at the Bedford School, because they didn't need that when they were working on decrypts. Peter Twining, who was running the operation there, um, was constantly writing back to his uh, relatives and friends in England, say, you may imagine we're having a great time here on an island uh, on the beach all the time, but things are actually really dangerous here. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I have outlined in the book is uh, Japanese and German thinking about Mauritius, um, which was highly threatening. 
the, the problem was that Mauritius lay very close to the main route from Cape Town to Australia. And uh, the Japanese uh, armed forces and German armed forces uh, were interested in neutralizing Mauritius and uh, taking control of Madagascar and thus cutting off communications between Britain and Australia and New Zealand. Um, Mauritius was bombarded several times, um, but it was never invaded. So although there was a definite risk, um, it didn't lead to an invasion. A number of ships that uh, arrived at or, or left Mauritius uh, were attacked by submarines and, and some were sunk in the waters off Mauritius. So the, the undersea warfare part of the war uh, was certainly taking place in the waters around Mauritius. Someone was also asking about the information on the station in Mauritius that came to light only 10 years ago, if we yes. understood correctly. How, how, how did you find it? You... Well, um, there, there are papers in the National Archives that have now been released. Um, mm. in, I've also been in touch with the Royal Society on Mauritius, um, which knew nothing about this. Um, I, I've been able to tell them about it. And I, I managed to find some uh, information also in uh, Surrey uh, History Archive in, in Woking, uh, which has some papers um, which were left by the sister-in-law of Peter Twining. She was uh, a woman who was the school secretary and in 1939, uh, <clears throat> she went out to uh, see her sister and Peter Twining um, on Mauritius for a holiday. And then the war broke out and Immediately, uh, a German cruiser was in action around Mauritius, sinking ships, uh, and so she was trapped. Uh, she had a good knowledge of French, so Peter Twining put her to work on the Vichy signals that were being intercepted from uh, Madagascar, and she discovered, her name was Evelyn, she discovered that uh, she had a talent for co-breaking, um, and she put her mind for the rest of the war um, to co-breaking. She learned some Japanese, and uh, she and others were working, uh, a whole bank of them as interceptors, intercepting messages, sorting out the likely useful messages from the likely trivial ones, um, and then uh, translating them, intercepting them. So um, there was uh, a bit of information that she has preserved, other information that uh, Twining's son has kept and he's kindly shared with me in Oxford. And there's quite a bit in the National Archives uh, as well. Uh, the Twining's own archives, which are now in the Bodleian Library, are not yet catalogued. But again, thanks to Peter Twining's son, um, I was able to, to look at those um, and see what um, documents um, had survived there. There's probably more to find, um, mm -hmm. but I, I had to give up uh, this search during the um, uh, pandemic and the various lockdowns. The, the most valuable messages um, on the Japanese side that were decrypted at Bletchley Park were those sent by Oshima Hiroshi, um, who was the Japanese ambassador in Berlin um, throughout the war. Um, Hiroshi, and I've included quite a lot about him in the book, um, was uh, a remarkable and most interesting man, um, but he had no idea that his messages were being read. Uh, he was a personal friend of Hitler's and he had a flawless command of German. And very frequently, he spent hours with Hitler alone, just the two of them, no interpreters, no note keepers, um, either with Hitler or with von Ribbentrop, with whom he's also on very close terms. They hid nothing from him. Um, they told him of their plans to foil uh, the Normandy landings or the landings across the Pas de Calais as they were expecting. They told him about the intended Operation Barbarossa, the attack on the Soviet Union. And all this, um, he then wrote in incredibly lengthy dispatches uh, in the embassy in Berlin. They were encrypted, um, but before they even reached Japan, they were in Bletchley Park being decrypted and uh, translated. And the ability to do that uh, was made possible um, by the fact that the United States uh, cracked the, Jap Japanese sorry, the Japanese diplomatic code, which used an encryption machine like Enigma called Purple. And the Americans uh, cracked that code um, made replicas of purple and then gave uh, three of those machines to Bletchley Park. So in Washington and in Bletchley Park simultaneously, these messages were being decrypted and read before they even got to Japan. And what's interesting is that the, the only form in which these messages now survive 
um, is the translated decrypts, because mm. the originals sent by Oshima from Berlin do not survive. They do not survive in Japan. The Japanese archives were burnt in 1945. And so the only uh, extant witness to the messages that Oshima was sending back are the translated decrypts that you can find in Bletchley Park or in the National Archives in Maryland, just outside Washington. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think that we could go on forever. There are so many stories, so many people, so many different places, so fascinating. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for your attention, everybody, and for the fascinating questions. Thank you.